Hello there, and welcome to Friendship Alliance Church, or more specifically, welcome to my living room. I thought I'd record from my home today. So uh, anyway, with that being said, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. Uh, that's where we're going to be in God's Word today, Romans chapter 14. And today, what I have for you is a standalone message. Typically, I, I do sermon series, uh, but for the next couple weeks, I'm not sure how many weeks, I'm just going to have some standalone messages for us. I'm not ready to, to jump into another series with you yet. And today's message that I have for you is called The Obstacle Course. And the idea of this message really shifted gears about midweek. Uh, originally, the, the concept of what I was going to be approaching is the obstacle course that believers set forth before an unbeliever. Uh, that's what I was going to explore first. What do I mean by that? I, I see a lot of times believers put down this obstacle course for unbelievers. We want you to talk like us. We want you to act like us. We want you to think like us. We want you to vote like us. Instead of having Jesus transform someone's, someone's life, someone's perspective, someone's worldview. The Bible says that he is the potter, that, that we are the clay. And sometimes I think we take it upon ourselves to, to, to try to do the molding and the shaping instead of letting Jesus do what he does best. He is the potter. We are the clay. And, and so often what I, what I see is believers just sort of expect the, the world to have Christ-centered values, a Christ-centered perspective, without first showing them Christ. They, instead, they we want you to think like us, act like us, talk like us. They put down this obstacle course first before showing them Jesus and what it means to have a relationship with him. And unbelievers, people that are looking at Christianity from the outside looking in, they're, they're turned off by it. They, they don't see the truth in love. They, they see truth in fear. They see truth in conforming. Oh, they just want me to, to think like him, act like him, all these things, right? And if history has taught us anything, it's that forcing Christianity into lives is going to lead to resentment towards Christianity. And, you know, maybe, maybe I'll take a deeper dive on that subject matter one of these days. But we're going to stay on this theme of the obstacle course. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at instead about the obstacle course that a believer puts down for another believer, because that happens as well. We see the obstacle course that believers put forth in front of unbelievers, but I want to look at the obstacle course that believers put down for other believers. And we're going to kind of see this unfold a little bit in Romans chapter 14. Uh, we're going to look primarily at verses 1 through 13. We're going to touch on some later verses uh, towards the end. Uh, but let's look at these verses together, starting in verse 1. It says this, Except the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat the one with contempt, though the one who does not and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. That's a key part right there, by the way. We're going to touch on that later. God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant to their own master? Servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another, and another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so for the Lord. Whoever eats meat and does so, uh, does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. Whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us li lives our lives alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord for this very reason. Christ died and returned to, uh, returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of, of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind to, to not put a stumbling block or obstacle, or might I add obstacle course, in the way of a brother or sister. 
Now, before we go take a deep dive into these verses today, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we come before you. We thank you for this time. And I pray that you would speak into hearts and lives today. I pray that we would be aware of the, the dangers of the stumbling blocks, of the obstacle courses that we throw down before one another. Help us to hear these words in a way that is constructive, that, that builds our faith, that uh, gives us guidance and direction today. Uh, we thank you for all that you are. We give you all the praise and glory. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So my first statement for us here is this, is that may we celebrate the faith, okay? May we celebrate the faith. What do I mean by that? Well, going back to verse two, it says this, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. So there's two different sets of people here. But how about we celebrate the fact that both of them have faith. We get so hung up on what they're eating here, right? One person eats anything, the other eats only vegetables. How about we get to the the basic principle and celebrate the fact that both people have faith. May, May we as Christians avoid the trap Uh, of getting hung up on these secondary disputable matters. How about we get back to to celebrating the faith that we all have, amen? You know, I was thinking about my my trip uh, this past summer to Spokane for our council. It's like where all the Alliance churches get together. It's like a thousand plus churches represented. And it was an overall, it was an overall positive experience, but there was definitely a part of me that left frustrated after hearing the the constant bickering and debating over over the secondary matters, over the disputable matters, just all the energy being spent just focusing in on thing on, on those things. And don't get me wrong, like people were civil in these debates and these discussions, but man, I couldn't help but to think to myself, like there are just bigger issues at hand than line item 4-3 section A or whatever. <laughs> like, There's just bigger issues at hand. I'm thinking, how about the poor and the oppressed just outside the event walls that we are having this big gathering of church leaders together? Like there, there are homeless people right outside of this event center. Like there's bigger issues at hand. And it was it was frustrating at times. It really was. But what gave me hope What gave me hope is that after those long and tedious, and might I emphasize tedious, debates and disagreements, we we all came back together in the evening and we sang together. We had praise and worship together. We We were able to get back to the common thread that we have faith in Jesus, and that is something to celebrate. It, that They may think this way, they may think that way, but man, Both of them have put their faith in Jesus. And once again, that is something to be excited about. That is something to celebrate. That is something to focus in on instead of the disputable secondary matters. And and this is why I say to the church, like, I I will go down with the ship. I will go down with the ship about giving secondary matters extra priority. I simply will not do it because... At the end of the day, like what really matters, what really matters we can find in verses eight and nine. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this reason, Christ Jesus, he died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. Like if we belong to the Lord, if we have that relationship with Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, that is what matters most, not the secondary matters, not the disputable matters. And and even Paul would go to, go so far to to this extreme. He would even go so far as to say this in Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. I encourage you to write those verses down. Philippians 1, 15 and 18. He says this, "It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill." The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. 
like when I read that, like motives sound like a pretty big deal, right? Like it, it, it's, it seems like a pretty big deal. Like someone preaching out of selfish ambition, like not being sincere, trying to stir up trouble. Like that sounds pretty major in my book. That sounds like a really big deal. But what does Paul say about it? What, what, what does he say about it? He says this in verse 18, but what does it matter? What does it matter? Who cares? The important thing, he says, the main thing is that in every way, whether false motives are true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I can rejoice. Paul is saying, look, even motives don't matter. That seems like a big thing, right? It doesn't matter in the big scheme of things because what really matters is if Christ is preached. That if people, if people are making a decision for Christ, that his good news continues to go forward. That's what matters most. And the difficulty I see in our day and age with social media, the news, all that, the, 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 big, the, the big thing I see, the big difficulty I see is to not make every issue, every ballot, Every culture war, the, the main primary focus. It's, it seems like that's what's happening all the time. We got to make this the main thing. We got to make this the big focus right now. And, and look, I'm not saying disregard like everything. Like, like these matters like have their place in the here and now. But what matters most and what we're hearing from Paul here is that if Christ is preached, if someone belongs to the Lord, and the thing is, like, it shouldn't even be close as far as the secondary disputable matters in comparison to Christ. It shouldn't be even close or on the same scale. But what I'm seeing is as the world gets a little crazier, you can debate that, but as the world gets a little crazier, I, I see the issues, the secondary matters, the disputable matters start climbing up that scale where it shouldn't even be close. Christ shouldn't even be on the same scale of the secondary matters but or the disputable matters. But we see all these things start to try to creep up on the scale. And it is time for Christians everywhere to say no to this, to say no to the secondary matters, the disputable matters, start gaining ground. It's time to say no. Colossians chapter 1, 17 and 18. He, being Christ, he is before all things. And in him, all things are held together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything, everything, I'm going to say that one more time. So that in everything, he might have the supremacy. Church, there is no secondary or disputable matter that will ever become larger than Christ. He is what matters most, and it is always going to be that way. Because look, Paul reminds us that someday, someday, each of you, every one of us as individuals, not a family plan, each of us as individuals is going to stand before God. And at that moment, I guarantee you, we're, you will, we will all understand what matters most. He says, look, you're going to stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God so that each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. We will all know at that moment what truly matters most. Amen. But once again, there, there are no shortage. There is no shortage of secondary matters or disputable matters. And might I add, there's always going to be the next thing also. There's always going to be a new thing. There's always going to be the next disputable matter. There's always going to be the next secondary matter. And even Paul acknowledges that because first he starts talking about food and then he, and then he starts mentioning sacred days. That's another area of, of dispute between believers at that time. Look with me in verses 5 through 6. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. And as I was reading that verse, I couldn't help but to remember my time working at the coffee shop at Sherry's back in Ohio. We had this person uh, every Friday. 
every Friday, they would buy all the scones, all the scones every Friday. And it always kind of bummed me out because I, we had these cranberry orange scones. Oh my gosh, those things were so amazing. I used to just eat those things so much. Like, I think I've lost so much weight since moving here because I don't eat the cranberry orange scones anymore. But anyway, this person buy all the scones, all the scones every Friday. And they, they would always make it a point of saying this. It's be, I, I do this on Friday because the true Sabbath, the true Sabbath is on Saturday. Like everyone else has it wrong, but I'm, I'm recognizing the true Sabbath. The true Sabbath is on Saturday. And, and they, they always did that. And I knew what they were doing. They were trying to get me to take the bait. Like they were looking for that debate. They, they wanted to quarrel over these disputable secondary matters. And I, and I wouldn't take the bait because I just like, okay, <laughs> that was my response. That's, that's great. Good for you. If you want to regard the Sabbath as a Saturday, good for you. If you want to do it on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, for that matter, I don't care. Good for you. Once again, the scripture says, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Good for you for setting a day aside and making it special to the Lord. But anyway, let's, uh, let's backtrack here. Let's backtrack and, and look at Paul's wording again. When he says someone's uh, faith being weak, what, what is he talking about there? Well, first of all, he does not mean that these people are not Christians. Once again, it, he clarified, like both people have faith and that's something to celebrate. He's not saying they're not Christians. They, they have faith in Christ. Nor, nor does he mean that they are spiritually immature in general. The, the weakness here is referred to specifically in this one particular area for this question alone. Because if you think about it, at the time that this is written, Paul's letter, Paul's letter, Christianity is at its infancy here in Paul's writing. And there were many, there were many who struggled with, with letting go of observing the law, the Old Testament law and religious rule following certain areas. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, they've been doing it for generation after generation after generation. Like, this is the way we have always done it. This is the rule. This is the tradition. And 2,000 years later, Christians still do this thing, do that same thing in certain areas. But Paul's audience here, they really struggled with, to accept that everything God created is good and can be used for a good purpose. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4 tells us, For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God, and prayer. So instead of condemning people whose faith might be quote unquote weak in a particular area, Paul is saying, look, accept them. Accept them where they are at on their journey today. Look, look at verse three again. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. That's the key right there. God has accepted them. Wherever they're at on their journey, God has accepted them. And if God has accepted them, who, who are we not to accept them? Amen? If God has accepted them, shouldn't that be enough for you and I to accept them and celebrate their journey of faith as well? I, but this must have been a struggle. This, this was definitely a struggle for them because later in verse 10, Paul would say this, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? They were struggling with this idea. Paul is reiterating here, look, don't pass judgment. Quit passing judgment, especially over these secondary, disputable matters. Remember that you are family members in Christ, even if they don't think like you, act like you, talk like you, whatever. And, and when you think about it, in this wild day and age that we live in, it should really give believers a sense of urgency to remember and to cling on to what really matters most, right? Preaching the word. By the way, that's not just for preachers. That's for all of us, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, belonging to God. The, the crazy world that we live in should give us a sense of urgency to get back to what matters most, right? And, I, and I've said it before and I'll say it again. Like The, the world that we live in is starving, for good news. And the gospel is the greatest good news that someone will ever hear. Let us go forth and share good news in a world that is starving for good news, right? Because that's what matters most. 
It's what matters most, and because of that's what matters most, let us not let us stop throwing down this this obstacle course for other believers. We want you to think like us, act like us, talk like us, vote like us, all these things. That's why it says in verse 13, stop passing judgment with one another. Instead, make up in your mind to not put a stumbling block or an obstacle, obstacle course, in the way of a brother or sister. Let's quit throwing down the gauntlet for one another. Quit throwing down this obstacle course, all these extra hoops to jump through. Because you know what? Life is hard enough, isn't it? <laughs> Seriously, life is hard enough. Like you don't need another obstacle course to go through. And I can tell you right now, I certainly don't need another obstacle course to go through either. Life, life is hard enough, man. But then, let me move on a little bit here. Paul, Paul goes further into this concept. And, and for me personally, personally, I, I wrestle with what he has to say here. I do. By the way, you've heard me say this before. It's okay to wrestle with God's word. It's okay to have questions, okay? I always say, if you're not wrestling with God's word, you're probably not reading God's word. It's okay to wrestle and question what, what's in God's word. It's okay to do so. But I, I specifically struggle with verse 15, but let me share verses 14 and 15 with you. It says this, I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing in itself is, uh, nothing is unclean itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, for that person, it is unclean. And here's verse 15. Here's, here's what I wrestle with. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your own eating destroy someone from whom Christ died. Now, I wrestle with verse 15. Because when I read that, my initial response is this. Like, aren't people responsible for their own actions and reactions? Aren't they responsible for them? And by the way, absolutely, they are. But I want to dig a little deeper here. Because once again, think of, think of Paul's setting and surrounding at the time that this is written. Paul is describing a scenario which was likely happening quite frequently in the early church. It was the early church. Christianity is very young at this point. And one group understood that in Christ they had been freed from following the law, so they freely enjoyed eating meat that might not have been kosher under the law. And the second group could not, at that time, could not allow themselves to step outside those the restrictions of the law at that time. So with that, Paul here, he's, he's zeroing in on those who are enjoying their freedom in Christ at the spiritual expense of Christians who believe it to be wrong. Paul says really directly and abruptly that a believer can't flaunt his or her freedom while claiming to, to love a fellow Christian. And really at the heart of it, it's, it's a warning against deliberately enticing another believer to do what for them would be sinful in their eyes. It, it's really kind of throwing down that obstacle. It's like intentionally enticing that believer to do something that they feel is wrong. It's throwing down that obstacle course instead of spurring one another along towards love and good deeds, which we have, called, which we have been called to do. And you know, the, the teaching and, and what Paul is instructing us here, how he's instructing us, it, it sounds, it, it is hard. It's difficult for us be, because in our culture because we value personal freedom so dearly. So it can be hard to kind of hear these words. And once again, absolutely, people are responsible for their own actions. But may we not lead another to violate their conscience. That's really what, at the heart of what is being said here. It, going back to my scone example, it, it would be like me forcing that person who swears that they can't buy her scones on a Saturday to make sure that she has to buy her scones on a Saturday. That's kind of what is being said here. And later on, Paul would say, look, about these secondary matters, these, these disputable matters, don't make them your focus. In fact, in verse 22, he says, well, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Don't make it the main focus. Keep it between you and God. 
Because bottom line, there, there are simply larger, more important matters at hand. And in verse 17, he makes that loud and clear. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking. Talk about the secondary matters, the disputable matters, but of righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit. They're simply bigger things, more important matters at hand. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Spirit. And then he says this in verse 19, let us, make, there, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. And you and I, we can, we can look at that for the sake of food. We can put that in the secondary matters, the disputable matters. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of secondary matters, disputable matters. Amen? And it doesn't say, the text doesn't say here to put in some effort. It says make every effort. Are, are we making every effort today to be at peace and, and building each other up and not focusing in on the secondary disputable matters? Are we making every effort to do so? That's a great question to ask yourself today. Are we making every effort, every effort? Because let's be honest, let's be honest. There, there are some people in our lives it takes more effort, right? You might be thinking of someone right now. You don't have to say their name out loud. They could be sitting next to you. There are some people, it might take more effort. We all have those EGRs in our life, those extra grace required people. For some people, it takes every effort for peace and mutual edification. It takes deliberate effort to prioritize peace and building up. It takes deliberate effort to not to give priority to secondary and disputable matters. It takes deliberate effort, every effort to remember if both have faith, that that's something to celebrate, amen? Instead of focusing on the areas that we don't see eye to eye on. Because once again, there are always, there's always going to be the next thing. There's always going to be the next thing for believers to disagree about. There's always going to be the next secondary matter that comes up. There's always going to be that next thing that pops up in culture. But there's only one God who we belong to. There's only one God who is above all things. There is one God who is the head of his church. And in everything, everything, he has the supremacy. Amen? Amen. Would you join me as we close together in prayer? Father, we thank you for this time. And in a world that tries to divide over every single issue, ballot, culture war, I pray for peace and unity. I pray for hearts and lives to focus on what matters most. What matters most? Belonging to you proclaiming your good news, sharing your good news. I pray that we would focus in on what matters most. Yeah, because you are truly above all things. You're not even on the same scale of the secondary disputable matters, God. And I, and I pray that you would guard our hearts uh, against that, that creeping up on the scale of making these, these issues, these secondary things, to try to raise them up on this scale, Lord, because you are truly above all things that you sit on an unshakable throne. You're not shaken by the issues and the matters and the secondary disputable things, Father. And I pray that we would truly make every effort to, to not throw down that stumbling block, that obstacle course for another believer on their journey of faith. Maybe celebrate the fact that we can have different opinions, different viewpoints, but we can all have the same faith in you. And may we be excited about that and may we celebrate that, Father. We thank you once again for this time. May you take this word and apply it to every area of our lives. And it is in your mighty name we thank you and praise you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you so much for joining me in my living room today here at Friendship Alliance Church. Uh, if you think that someone else could be blessed by this word today, I encourage you to please like, share, uh, subscribe to our church's uh, YouTube channel. It really helps the, the good news of Jesus Christ go forward. We're not interested in drawing attention to ourselves, but we are interested in preaching the good news and having the gospel go forward. So every like, share, subscribe helps us to, to share the good news. So I encourage you to do so. Uh, lots of ways that you can stay engaged and connected with us. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all those places. Uh, you'll find all the links to that in our video description. 
Uh, all the songs that we do at our in-person service, you can find that, uh, you'll find links to those in the video description as well. Uh, something else that I always mention is that we do not believe that church online should be a consumed experience, but a shared experience. So we encourage you to watch this with other people, spur one another along towards love and good deeds. So that's what the Bible calls us to do. So uh, we encourage you to watch this with other people. And uh, with that in mind, uh, have an awesome, blessed week, church. And uh, we'll see you back here next week. May God bless you.